couple of days ago. Uh, or, well, it's at the theater where Oswald was arrested. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, How'd that go? Well, it went all right as far as I was concerned. I, I just have one thing to say, and that's, uh, uh, I tell it like it is, as far as I know. And uh, if anybody else wants to add something, that's, that's for them to live with. <laughs> well, that's, I don't care what the truth is, as long as it's the truth. I don't consider myself to be a conspiracy theorist. Yeah. Um, I, I look at myself more as a as a reporter. Yeah. And um, well, I get, uh, of course, I probably get uh, fifteen or twenty reports from somewhere about uh, somebody's. Uh, theory of what happened and so forth. I just got one a, a couple of weeks ago from Russia and where a man said that he was hired by Russia to teach Oswald uh, Russian and uh, but he he said he and his wife come to take come over come over to you come to the US and he said they rent a car when they come and then they drive around. That's the way they, whatever country they go to, or they just rent them a car and just drive around. And he said we drove by that building where uh, the president was shot. And he said as soon as I drove past that building, I knew immediately that Oswald did not kill the president. So he, he 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 figured that by just driving, just driving by, by the and, building and they were stopping. So well, well, you uh, of course you you were handcuffed to Oswald when Bob Jackson yeah. took that world famous photograph yeah. of you and uh, yeah. I've I've talked to Bob Jackson in the past. Wonderful man, great sense of humor. Um, I know you've met him. Uh, Who was that? Uh, uh, Bob Jackson. Oh, I know him. He's been here to the house. He yeah. to visit with me several times, and I've been out to his home in Colorado. Yeah, I know Bob. We're good friends. Yeah, he has a great sense of humor. We had a yeah. we had a very good time. I I uh, called him about using that particular photograph in a book that uh, my best friend over in the UK uh, mm -hmm. wanted to use that, and so I contacted Bob to get the rights for him to do that and I did that and we had a we had a wonderful discussion. I had a great time mm -hmm. talking to him. Um, I know you've been asked every question on this and I, I don't want to bore you with that stuff, but um, I know you've had well, the answer. If you got one that's burning you up, go ahead and I'll, <laughs> well, I'll get it off your brain. <laughs> and then, well if I had nine hours I'd ask you all kinds of stuff and you'd be stuck. Um, of course, I've heard you say this before. What was your general impression of Oswald when you met him and then all through that day? Well, uh, of course, uh, to me, he was a young man that wanted to be somebody important and uh, he would do he would do things in order to put himself in that light. Uh, when we when we would have to move him through a crowd of reporters, why well, he was just eating it up. He was, and of course, they were asking all types of questions, and they had their microphones and their uh, uh, cameras shoved over there in his face. And you could tell that he was just eating it up. He he and he was enjoying it. It just just exactly what he wanted to do. And uh, so, and it brought back to me what his brother told me. His brother Robert was, uh, 
turned out to be a real good man and, and honest and and I learned to like him real well and we got along fine and in fact I drove up to their home and had dinner with he and his wife and when I asked him something I got a true answer back from him because Robert uh, he knew exactly what was what his brother was like and uh, and he had the same opinion as I did that he uh, wanted to be uh, admired and 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 uh, liked and so forth and uh, and but and you could see that in him. In fact, Robert told me that. Uh, when he came back from Russia, he and Marina come back from Russia, he went to the airport to meet them. And when they got their baggage and everything and, and started out, uh, uh, he asked Robert, well, well, where is all the television? Where are they? they right down there. And so Robert said, I told him, well, they were following me, but I gave him the dodge and got out and missed them. So even Robert knew what what it was what it was like. And so so do you think that that Robert Robert basically thought from the beginning that his brother did this? Oh, he knew it was. Yeah, he he never questioned it in a minute. Uh, so yeah, he didn't have any he didn't have any doubt at all. How did how did he talk about Robert? How did Robert talk about his mother? Uh, I've read various well, things. He, uh, he, uh, he, to me, he told me that uh, uh, the the brother, the way he ended up like he like he did, was because of his mother. Cause he said I was raised by my uncle, and he was raised with with my mother, and she didn't uh, discipline him, discipline him, and uh, try to try to get him to do the right thing and and she herself didn't always do the right thing so and he said she was responsible for what for the way he grew up and, and the way that, so and I think he's right because I contact I was in contact with her only one time and uh, that was enough. I didn't need to talk to her anymore. So. She had that kind of personality. Oh yeah, that, and uh, but like I say, uh, Robert knew it, and, and uh, his and his wife, uh, she she said the same thing, of course, because uh, she she knew her brother-in-law real real well, and that. Uh, he never wanted to do what everybody else did. He had a he had something he wanted to do a little different, and so. And, but uh, I, I don't know. Well, of course, when I interrogated him, I was the first one to interrogate Robert. Uh, not Robert, but uh, 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 God, dog. What's his name? Uh, uh, Lee Harvey. Lee Harvey. I was the first one to interrogate well, him. Well, tell me, tell me how that circumstance came about. That you got to be the first person to, to. Honey, are you are you sure the sound is picking up on this? You can, I don't know. You could probably scoot this a little closer. To, okay. To get a better picture. Yeah, if you want to want to scoot over closer, you could. Okay. It's it's probably picking it up just fine. Um, you can just put the phone where you need to so that we can pause it a minute yeah or? and then and I, I'm gonna have something to show them um, from this I want them to, to know the history of yeah. this um, so so how did you become yes. well, involved in being the first one to interrogate him? well very very simple really uh, Captain Fritz uh, took all the other officers and signed them in pairs at areas where there was a possibility of having problems and so he all the other officers out of my office up there my partner was on vacation and captain didn't believe in signing one man to a deal he wanted two men because and since i didn't have a partner he said well you can just 
do whatever you need to do today. And uh, so I thought I was going to have a day off. And, uh, and I could go out to eat when I got ready and uh, do, uh, do whatever else I needed to do. And didn't have to worry about anything. But it didn't work that way. And uh, in fact, my day lasted till nearly 3 o'clock in the morning before I got to go on oh, my free day day off, as I put it. But uh, I, I borrowed a man from the patrol division because I had a, I went and picked up a a prisoner that, were, that I had information he would hold up, and uh, so I figured I'd better get me somebody with me. That's the reason I called uh, called down the patrol and told them I need to borrow a man for the day. And so they sent me a man up, and, and uh, we went out and sure enough, he was there, which is kind of surprising because nine times out of ten, it, this the information is no good. Well, we arrested him, come on in, and when we got into the basement, uh, uh, I heard the uh, dispatcher talking, and he was saying that they were they were at the down at, uh, on uh, where they had to make the turn down, uh, to get over on Elm Street to, to go to where the luncheon was going to be held. And but uh, so I got caught the elevator and went up to my office. Uh, and uh, during the time that I was on that elevator going up there, the president got shot. And as soon as I got up there, I, uh, the uh, uh, lieutenant told me, well, they shot the president. And I said, oh, yeah, 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 I know they shot the president. Because I had just heard them just minutes, just minutes earlier. And they were, they were perfectly all right. But... So, uh, th so you thought they were okay. And then you get told he was, he's been shot. But in your head, you think he's okay? Well, I didn't have a clue. You don't have a clue when you get to when something like that happens. You have to, you just have to take whatever you hear. Right. And now, uh, when when the dispatcher come on and uh, was talking about the president being shot, then I realized the lieutenant was telling me the truth. And uh, so he told me, he said. Uh, uh, put that man up and get down there and find out what's going on because he said I'm getting calls on it now And he said I don't know what to tell him because I don't know so get down there and find out what's happening and call me back and let me know and so me and uh, Charlie Brown the man I'd borrowed got in a car and drove down there and we got at the end of Elm Street and pulled in there to the last block and of course, there's several cars blocking that, and I, I thought it was just a red light they was waiting for. It turned out that the police had blocked that street, and they were tied up there. They wasn't going nowhere. So we just eased our car over to the curb and got out and left and walked on down. And when we got there, the, uh, the, uh, the deputy chief uh, on the garden that get door, and uh, when he saw me, he said, "Your your officers are upstairs searching now." And and he said, uh, uh, "He said y your officers up there." And uh, and uh, he said, "But I've had several people come by here and tell me something, and and uh, I that they had seen or heard or something." And he said, "I didn't know what to do with them, so I sent them to the sheriff's office." So uh, and I said, well, in that case, I'd better go over and check on and see what they, see what they know, if anything. And so I went over there, and the deputy sheriff that was in 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 the office there, as far as he he was wringing his hands like this. He said, I got all of your prison, uh, your witnesses. What do you want me to do with them? I said, well, I need, I need statements taken from her. Can't you get your men in to take statements and uh, for me? And I, he said, oh, yeah, well, I can do that. So he called his dispatcher to start ca calling his deputies in. And uh, 
But about that time, there was six uh, 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 officers from the Burglar and Theft Division showed up. And they said, Jim, we were sent up here to help you. What do you need? I said, you're exactly what I need. I said, those people, there's about 17, 18 of them. <clears throat> I said, they claim to have seen something that might be important. Scatter out at the desk out there and take their statements down and have them get, put their name, address, and phone number and everything on it and tell them that I will be in touch with them sometime today. But if maybe not today, I may not have time today, but otherwise I'll be with you the, the next day. And then uh, uh, I thought, well, I'll run back over to the school book depository to see what was happening. And I told him, I said, I'll be back in just a little bit to help you with it. But as I started to leave the sheriff's department, I heard him on a come on there and he said a police officer, Dallas police officer, had been shot in Oak Cliff. Well, when a, Oak, when a police officer is shot, a homicide officer has to go to the scene to, to be sure of what, uh, what, what happened. So I went there and I found that they shot Tiffet, but I had uh, four witnesses uh, that was able to see that shooting. And there's three ladies and uh, one uh, cab driver. And uh, so I used them later on when I had time. I, I brought them in and I put uh, Oswald in a show up and they all was able to recognize him right at this bang like that. Didn't have any, have no trouble getting him identified. I heard that, that he complained when he was in the lineup or one of the lineups that he was the only one with a t-shirt on and the others. Well, you hold a, you hold a show up and you're going to find something every one of them got, got that don't uh, match and uh, that's just a, that's just a natural thing for them to do. And, uh, but when they, uh, when you, when you open that show up for them to look at and they point directly at that one there and say, that's the one that I had. So uh, I, I saw him here or there. And they don't even look at the others. They just look at that one. You know, you got a good ID. So, right so you feel that you got every one of them identified Oswald right off? Oh yeah. I no doubt about it. And, uh, so. But anyway, that's what was happening, and, uh, and one thing led to another. And I, uh, and of course, he was assigned to me as my prisoner. And if anything happened, if anything because was, you were the homicide investigator that had to be there. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, I was. I had. To, I had to do whatever. If they wanted him to, wanted him for something except when he went down to the office to talk, uh, to the captain's office, go in there. I didn't go in there with him. I just, I had other things to do while the captain was talking to him. I, uh, I, I called, got in touch with the judge and filed, uh, filed a murder on him for that because I had those witnesses was solid. And I, so I, I filed a case of murder on him for uh, shooting Tippett and uh, so I stayed busy like that doing things and uh, of course uh, over a period of time while there's hundreds of uh, reporters from all over the dang world showed up I think uh, of course when the uh, president was uh, uh, murder was announced it went worldwide and uh, every reporter uh, in in a hearing little case of it, packed their fags and come, and we had them here. And uh, they, I got so aggravated with them, I, was, I tried to get the chief to move them out and get rid of them. And, and uh, some, uh, but they was right at our office door. And uh, one time, when the captain was through talking with him, I, he usually some of us would. Well, some of the other officers, I did little, very little of it. 
but they take him and two of them and escort him up to his cell and put him in there. One time <clears throat> I was walking by the door headed to do something when the captain finished talking to him and uh, but he only had well, there's only one officer there. I don't know where the rest of them were. So I told this officer, I said, well, I'll go with you. And so we brought him out and I got in front of him and I had my hands on his shoulders and I was walking backwards with him. And we got through the door and we had to walk a uh, distance of, uh, not quite as far as here to that front door from where we were to where I could unlock a door and get into the elevator and take him upstairs. And as I was walking backwards there, and they were just thick as flies on manure, uh, they uh, uh, holding me like this, and I felt something on my knees, and I looked down there, and there's a joker with a camera with my stuck between my legs and trying to take a picture. I'd never heard that before. And uh, so I tried to send him about ten feet backward down the hallway with my foot. <laughs> it about halfway. I mean, I got 10 feet, but I got, I, I, I sent him back a good bit. Of course, he got out of my way. I never, I never saw him anymore. <laughs> <Yeah. clears throat> but that's what we had to put up with. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, anyway, uh, there was different things took place. Uh, and, that, and the captain had certain things to do. And, of course, Oswald, when I talked to him about uh, some things, uh, of course, he denied everything. And, but he what, asked, he what asked, sort of things did you ask him? Well, I was asking him about uh, all the, his, his name and his address and all of this and, and so forth. And then I, I got in into the about shooting. See, he was arrested. I, when I first started talking to him, I had no idea he shot the president. I, we were just talking to him about Tibbet. That's what I was talking to him because I didn't know that he was going to be a uh, suspect in the presidential thing at that particular time. So I asked him about shooting the officer. And, well, he knew he was arrested for shooting the officer and I asked. And so I asked him, I said uh, something about shooting the officer. And he said, well, I didn't shoot anybody. Well, that was a wrong answer to, for that question. And I thought about picking it up for a little bit, and then I thought, well, no, I'll just hold off on it. What was wrong about it is uh, the right answer to that. I had worked two other police officers' murders, and in talking to them, they'd always say, I didn't shoot the uh, police or I didn't shoot the officer. And when he said I didn't shoot anybody, that told me there's another shooting involved somewhere. And uh, so, uh, but I didn't know where, and I, I hesitated because I didn't want to screw it up. I wanted to be able to time on it when I started talking to him about it. So I, I asked him something else. But uh, it, it wasn't long after that till the Captain Fritz come in and uh, uh, and he was going getting ready to send people in different directions to find and look for him because he had they had searched that sixth floor out and didn't find him and he was looking for a stranger up there he wasn't looking for an employee so when he didn't find a stranger he asked it the manager down there to uh, check his, all of his employees and see if he's all there. So he come back in a few minutes and he said, well, uh, that Oswald was missing and he don't have permission to be gone. Well, let's set the cap off real high. Well, he just knew he was on the right deal then. And he said, give me his address. I want to go to check on him. And uh, because he had told him he was gone, he didn't have permission to be gone. So they went out to his address, that address he had. Lo and behold, he didn't live there as a phony address. So he kept really, really got into it then. He thought, well, he, he has to be the right one. So he come back to the office. 
all hot and ready to send people in different directions to try to find him. When somebody told him, well, the man Lavelle's talking to has got a name similar to that. And so he come and asked me what his name was, and I told him it was Lee Harvey Oswald. And he looked at Oswald and he said, where do you work? He said, the school book depository. Boom, I lost my prisoner cap. So you're the man I want to talk to. <laughs> so I, I lost him. He took him and went in and started talking to him about the presidential shooting. So what was what was Oswald's demeanor with you when you were talking to him? Oh, he was very polite to me and uh, answered my questions in a nice manner and just as pleasant as in, as anybody you want to talk to, talk to. And he didn't get he didn't get angry. Uh, Captain Captain made him made him angry when he I don't know what he said to him, but he. As I was walking by the office one time, I, I heard uh, Oswald raising his voice. So they had, Cap had said something to him that he didn't like, so he raised that. But to me, he, he kept a good demeanor all the time. Did, uh, and I've heard that he uh, at some point was, they showed him pictures of, of uh, Oswald with the rifle, and he said, that's not me, that's... Uh, somebody with uh, their uh, uh, my head on their body. Were you present for that? Oh, I've heard that story too, and but in different ways. So I don't know. I didn't hear him. I never heard him say anything. Of course, uh, of course, he denied uh, shooting. Uh, shooting it, and, and like it just said to me, he didn't shoot anybody. But uh, we uh, we. We, t we tracked everything. We, uh, I won't even get into that. That's too long. But anyhow, uh, we, 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 when we got, got everything squared away after the shooting, after he was shot, we started with, his, uh, with the window there where the suits were found. We got those... Uh, uh, cartridges and matched and we found his rifle uh, we and uh, we put, matched it to the paper where, that he had wrapped up and uh, we tied it up tight from one end to the other and uh, the the uh, even the bullet that come out of the president uh, we matched the firing it on the firing with the and it matched his rifle, and the bullets, the shells underneath the window there, we checked them against his rifle and it that showed that it was fired in that rifle, and were, we went step by step by step, and we we covered everything, and and so there's nothing there's nothing to for anybody to find uh, elsewhere and like I say when you when you can compare the bullet that comes out of somebody's head and it matches the rifle that uh, the man the victim that the suspect had wh what are you gonna do you gonna say well somebody else must have threw that bullet at him uh, so it's, did you ask the question? that of uh, of him where he said well everybody will know who i am now well and what I, led up to that well i heard that he said that i didn't hear him say it but it sounds like him so i would i would believe that he said it do you think but just the limited amount of time that you had and you you were an experienced police officer did did you feel that oswald felt that he was smarter than everybody else well, I think he thought he was clever enough to that he could talk around and and and, and uh, get get us to believe something that wasn't so. Yeah, I think I think he thought he he, he could do that, but uh, that wasn't what happened. Of course, we took him. Uh, well. I'm not going to get into that, but uh, no, please do get into whatever you I, like. I haven't got the time for that, but I anyway, understand. 
uh, we we covered everything that we that needed to be covered from from a toes to the top of his head you might say uh, we didn't leave anything left unturned so we we traced the gun from his from where he spent the night he usually went out there on Fridays and spent the night where his wife was staying they had temporarily separated and and he'd go out there with this friend that worked there they, he'd take him out and bring him back to work and on Fridays and then he'd come back on, on the Monday morning uh, this time he went out on Thursday night and this young man that was giving him the ride back and forth asked him the next morning when he got into the car he saw this bundle laying on the back seat wrapped up in brown paper and he asked him said what do you got in the bundle he said uh curtain rods for my apartment so what we did later on uh we went in there and took that paper spread it out on the floor and if you know if you wrinkle that brown paper it's going to crease and we laid it out and we put his his rifle in that thing and it fit just like a glove right mm -hmm. in there on that line. so you did put the rifle oh yeah in, into yeah. the paper bag we, we laid it down right into it and careful not to make any extra bends in it and uh so, so this is what we did with everything else like and uh we 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 tried it to make it fit and so i'm satisfied with it just like it is and of course these people that don't want to believe it they want to they want something else and uh but i just like to hear about the history from the person that was there so uh, uh, I'm, now I'll, I'll ask you the the the, the story of uh, how you managed to you, you had to move Oswald, and that's how you wound up in that famous picture seen around the world. Tell me about the events of that. The what? When when you were handcuffed to Oswald, and and be, right before he was shot by Ruby, can you can you give me a little of that story? Well, yeah. Well, as I told you earlier, that he was assigned to me. Right. So anything, any movement, of course, had to, had to be done with him come through me. And so when they got ready to transfer him, I I had to see that he got his clothes that was dressed right and dressed all right and sweater there that he wanted to put on because it was a little cool that day. And... Uh, I don't know, he asked a few questions, which uh, I don't remember what they were now, but, <clears throat> and when, I, when he's putting that sweater on, I told him, I said, Lee, I hope if anybody shoots at you that they're, they're as good a shot as you are. And he started laughing at me. Well, that was a mistake. He, he, he wasn't supposed to laugh at that, at that deal. So... But why was he laughing? Because we was complimenting him on his shooting and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, he he liked that. Anything that brought him up above... Was, was, uh, it fed his ego. And, yeah, and that ego, yeah, exactly. And uh, so I said, well... I, 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 and then I said, well, I just if they shoot at you... He said, oh, nobody's going to shoot at me. And they put a lot of people put the famous last words on that because I didn't get him out of there. So when I got down to the basement with him, and I looked in, they had that big crowd in there of police officers and reporters and stuff. And uh, uh, Ruby was standing back, oh, a, f a few feet back. But uh, when I walked in. I was walking, I was walking toward him, and I, as I walked in, I saw Ruby, and he was standing, standing still, but among all the police and the others, 
and he had a gun in his left hand and he had it against his leg like this. So I made a move to get to that, get to that pistol and uh, and I almost got him and of course he took two steps towards me and I could I could catch him by the shoulder at that time. I reached over and grabbed his shoulder but he had that gun in his hands and it and he had it pointed at uh, Oswald, who was right, uh, I was holding him by me and I pulled him in. And he pulled that trigger and the bullet uh, come in and hit him right along here. And, uh, uh, but uh, when I, when I jerked him, jerked him back, uh, he was, uh, uh, pulled back on Oswald and pulled him around. Uh, he was, uh, Jack was, had, had, of course he'd changed it over to his right hand, but when uh, my partner on the other side, he had, uh, let me have his hand, of course he changed that over to his right hand, well, else he grabbed this hand here, and then let me see that hand. Here he grabbed the pistol, the cylinder, and so it, so that the cylinder wouldn't turn. And when I saw that, I knew I was saved because <laughs> I knew that the LC would die before he turned that cylinder <laughs> loose. And I knew also that he Jack wasn't going to fire it as long as he held that cylinder because it won't turn, as you may know. Right, right. And. Uh, but uh, he, uh, Jack had his pistol pointed at the time when all that moving around, he, the pistol was pointed at me right along here, and he was working the f hand, pulling the trigger. But of course it wouldn't fire because L.C. was holding the gun. So I told L.C., I said, partner, you're going to be my hero for the rest of my life. I said, I owe you my life because... He saved you. Uh, saved me, yeah, and because uh, if he hadn't held on to that, I'd have taken two of them right in, right in here. Mm. And uh, so, as a bullet did go in over here, and it it hit some bones and stuff, and made a it made a circle, uh, and went around him, and ended up right over here. I could I could just roll that bullet around under his skin just like that. Mm. So, and that's what I what I did when I went in and I ch found where it was. And then when I took him out to the parkland, uh, the uh, as I shoved the the, the uh, uh, what I was holding him on uh, inside, the doctor started to pull it, and I said, "Wait a minute!" I, I said, "Before you take him in there, I want that bullet out of him." And, he said, where? And I said, right here. So he pinched it up and hit it with a scalpel and it just popped out into a tray that the nurse was holding. And then I took a pocket knife out of my pocket and I had one that had a real sharp point on it. And I wiped that bullet off and then I told that nurse, I said, scratch your initial on the inside of that bullet. And her name was... Uh, uh, I don't know, she's Audrey or something like that. Audrey Bell. And she put a A on it right there in the middle. And uh, So you could feel with your fingers the bullet as it went around and, and lodged there under the skin. Well, no, I didn't, I couldn't see it, I had to hunt for it. But, uh, but you could feel it once you... Once went. I found it, oh yeah, yeah, I could, I could feel it. Well, that wasn't the first time I had taken bullets wow. out of somebody anyway, so it wasn't... So it wasn't nothing new to me, and uh, but I took it. I talked to the FBI director uh, oh, some months later, and uh, I told him the same thing I told you. And when I come to this part here, and he sat there for a minute, he said, Jim. He said, you know what, that's a real smart thing you did getting that bullet out of there and using it for evidence. 
I said, well, that's what I thought too. He said, I doubt if my men would have thought of that. I said, that's thinking the same thing too. <laughs> <laughs> so, What was going through your head? I know it's unfair to ask this question all these years later. What was going through your head at the moment that Ruby came out to shoot and, and you could see what was happening? Was there anything that you remember that was specifically going through your mind at that instant? Well, well certainly. I, I knew what was fixing to happen. I knew he was coming to shoot the Oswald. And my thoughts all was, how am I going to save him? That's the reason I was pulling him, trying to pull him behind me. Of course, some people said, what do you want to pull him behind you? That made you a big, bigger target. Uh, and they wanted, a lot of people asked me, did I get frightened or was I scared or this, that. That never entered my mind. And uh, the, about uh, uh, getting shot or being frightened, it didn't. It never entered my mind. All my mind was on was trying to save this man's life. And so you would have put your own body between him. Well, and yeah, Ruby. I had it. I had it between them, but uh, and it, and it ended up. But uh, he. Uh, but uh, else he had just grabbed his hand in time to keep it from shoot, uh, shooting me. I'd have been shot uh, while defending Oswald and kind of keeping him uh, safe. Uh, well, I've been shot at too many times. I, I've had one man shoot at me one time and uh, on a deal that. Uh, try, I was trying to get a lady out of a room, out of a window, because uh, she was a hostage, and there was uh, th three hostages in there at one time, and in the house, and we finally got got them out, uh, and then uh, I, uh, my lieutenant and I was around the corner. We tried to get the lady out. She was quite husky and. And we, the, th the uh, other three people, we got them out. But tw what we were doing was, it had a window like right here on this side of the room. And then over here, they were uh, going into a bedroom. And when we'd leave them quiet for a while, he, and well, we'd, we'd get people to go over on the other side, of, on the outside, and bang on the wall like we was breaking in and he and he had pistols and uh, rifles and uh, oh I don't know what all uh, had, had uh, a mask and uh, uh, everything to protect himself with and, and so I told the lieutenant we was had walked around and I said come here and and get a hold of this woman that she she finally stuck her head out the window yeah well I had told the, the other officers they'd asked me about throwing tear gas in there after we managed to get the hostages out and I said yeah go ahead so they they knocked all the glass out of the window throwing those tear gas t deals in there and until I heard one of the hostages holler don't throw anymore then I realized what happened they eating her up with that tear gas, mm. so I told them not to throw any more in. <clears throat> and uh, so, uh, uh, anyway, uh, when he was gone, well, I thought the lieutenant, they had got the rest of the other people out, except for the old lady who lived there. And we had her, she got herself sticking out the window and I had a hold of her shoulder and everything, and Lieutenant had the other side. Well, he came he came back in from there, and he had the rifle in his hands. Well, I'm on this, he came in that door, and I'm over here, I'm the closest one to him. So he threw that rifle up and shot four times, and I checked it later on. Those four bullets hit the uh, frame, window frame on that door about two inches from my head. Mm. And uh, another time I was tr trying to arrest a man and we, me and my 
partners hit the front door, knocked it open. Of course, we had we had been told that he had two forty fives <laughs> when uh, uh, that anybody knocked on the door. He stood up and cocked them and pointed them at the door. And the sergeant was that got hollered at me to go with him on that search warrant. I said, I said, Harvey, what do you need me for? I said, you got three of your people here. I, I said, why are you going down? I said, a search warrant like is easy to do. He said, yeah, but that ain't the, that ain't the deal. He said, I've been told that he stands up and cocks those two forty fives and points them at the door. I said, well, in that case, a man can get hurt pretty easy. You know, yeah, he said, that's the reason I'm waiting for you to get here to go with me. <laughs> so I said, well, all right, let's do it. And so we went over and got in and we knocked on the door real, he, we knocked on it real light. You, you don't do it like the movie short, bang, bang, bang. You, you just take a real light knock if you want a character to come to the door. <laughs> And he just hit very lightly. A young girl come and opened the door, and when she, when she did, Harv and I both hit it and, and and knocked it wide open. Well, he was sitting inside that door, just kind of like she is. The corner of the room was right there, and he had an easy chair right right on against the wall. And when that door opened, uh. Uh, well, we were within within uh, six or eight inches of each other when I uh, but he had the forty five in his lap like this, and he come down and got it bang like that. Well, uh, the bullet went under my chin right mm -hmm. here, and it uh, burned burned uh, burned my face along here. The powder from the gun mm -hmm. burned my face along here. And uh, so, uh, but I reached over and he had a good head of hair and I reached over and grabbed him by the head of the hair and I jerked him out away from me like that and he hit on his stomach over here and he still had the gun in his hand. So I run over there and stepped, <laughs> on, his, stepped on his wrist with this foot and kicked the gun out of his hand and it went up under the deal. And then Hummer, the, the other officer, the, two of our officers went to the back door, and we uh, Hummer, I called him because he's always humming to himself. He uh, <laughs> he uh, was there, and but he he had shot about the same time that he fired his pistol, and I I, I didn't realize it. I thought it was not one death, but he <laughs> he had stuck that shotgun in there. And, Blow the big hole in him right here, mm. but it didn't kill him. He lived over it, and uh, of course he said, uh, uh, "When I talked to him later after we got uh, got things squared away, he he said, well, I didn't know you all was polo police.' I said, "Who do you think would be knocking on the door?" I said when when Harvey answered, I called out police with a search warrant, <laughs> loud enough to hear it for a block. I said, "Don't tell me you didn't hear that." And, but he lived over it. But uh, of course, he went to the penitentiary too. Mm. He was supposed to have stolen a lot of securities out of New York City, and he also was supposed to have a lot of hard narcotics. And he had it all. Yeah, we, we, we found it all. You got him. Yeah. I'll get out of your hair in just a second. I know you got a lunch date coming up. Um, this has followed you for 55 years at this point. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever think that it would? And do you have any regrets about that? Well, I don't have any regrets. Uh, uh, if I had any regrets at all, it would be that we could we could handle it a little better. I would, I would change the way we went in on it. I had that first place. I would not have had all of those people in there. I, I'd have told them, you, you wait outside, and when we secure this transfer here, then you can come in and 
holler out your questions if you want to. But I'd have, I'd have moved on everybody out of the way because uh, Jack uh, was able to camouflage himself in there among the reporters and the mm -hmm. police officers. And it dang never got two people killed instead of one. Did you did you know uh, Ruby pretty well? Oh yeah, I knew him real well, because he uh, he uh, he liked police and he liked to be around them and he'd come up to visit sometime and the officers uh, would let him come in and so forth and uh, I had uh, uh, when I first met him he had a uh, dance hall down in South Dallas <clears throat> and he had always had a good crowd down there and I was patrolling that area and so of course back in those days the law was that you uh, uh, that uh, that you uh, closed at midnight those bars and everything. So I I remember going by and telling him uh, well my first night and daddy and I said well I introduced myself to him and I, I told him I said now, you know you're supposed to close this place at midnight. That, that's 12 o'clock. He said, yes, sir, I know that. I said, well, I don't want to come by here and find the <laughs> shades pulled and you got people in there partying. And midnight. He said, well, I'll assure you it'll be closed. And he, and he did. Every time I went by there, that place was closed at midnight. Because <laughs> I run it several times just to see. Because I figured he might try something, but... In fact, he never did lie to me, as far as I know. I, I, when I asked him something, I'd get the truth from him. He never did. He never did lie to me, as far as I know. And uh, so, in fact, uh, one of the other bars that they was always trying to sneak around by holding the uh, turning the lights low and, and pulling the shades and stuff and having their friends stay in water. And I had to, I had to file a case on them and I told them that, uh, we, that uh, I was going to do it. I called them a couple of times and I said, this is the last time I won't tell you. <laughs> and uh, so somewhere down the line after that, I don't know where, one of the sergeants that worked on the far north side, uh, he lived over in that section. And I guess he might have went in there, uh, into that bar time or two. But anyway, they had, uh, he's, uh, in fact, well, one night, uh, working late nights, I got a call that a gang fight was out back of the that veterans hospital and uh, so I started over there but this sergeant come on the air I didn't hear it because I was out of the car at the moment and he told the dispatcher said you better send somebody else out there on that, that cover with Lavelle he said I've heard that they are going to fake a gang fight and get, get Lavelle in the middle of it and stick a knife in him mm. so he said you better get uh, uh, somebody else out there well, I had a new partner, and he didn't understand all of that. He didn't understand it. He, I guess he thought I heard it, but I didn't. When I got back, in, he called me and told me we had a call. So we got back in, and I said, what is it? And he said, gang fight. So I took off. I was driving. And when I got to the gang fight, all of a sudden, I ran, coming from the other direction was three police cars. Uh, with police officers with red lights and sirens going blue. And I said, what in the world are they doing? I never get that kind of help on a gang fight. And they come up and just come to a screeching halt right in the group when there's about seven or eight of them out there. And uh, so I got out and, and it was this group yeah, from the, from the, from the, from the it was, that was them. So I grabbed the 
first band I saw, I said, come on over here, let me have a little talk with you. He said, now Jim, I didn't call your wife. I said, I said, no, you didn't. I said, uh, who called my wife? Somebody had called her. <laughs> and, to, and asked her what uh, if uh, some girl lady had called her and asked her. She said, you know what your husband does after 11 o'clock at night when he gets off work? <laughs> and, and, they, and, of course, <laughs> <laughs> they, they told her that he comes out here, hangs around with us people, and drinks beer with <laughs> these girls working out here. Well, uh, what uh, happened later? Well, what happened when he, when they when they uh, they called? They, I had told my wife because uh, this girl. Uh, she had asked me what my wife was going to say if she found out what I was doing. I'd come out and drink with them after hours. And I said, well, there's only one thing wrong with that. I don't do that. And she said, well, this case that I had filed on was coming to trial. Uh. And so that's what they were getting ready for. And so she said, well, they... Yeah, they, they will, uh, anyway, uh, ask her, and I had told her what might happen, and so when that woman called her and asked her, she said, do you know what your husband does that night when he gets off at 11 o'clock? She said, oh yeah, I know what he does. <laughs> she said, they said, what? She, and she called that bar by name. That he goes out at this bar and, and plays around with them whores out there. Oh. <laughs> and I love my wife better for, after that. <laughs> uh, so they didn't get anything on her. And... Well, I don't think I could top that. I think I better stop now. You're so at one hour. I just, yeah. I just really appreciate your time. All right. Well. I, I imagine they're going to be here before long. Yeah, yep, I better yep. get, get myself dressed and I ready. don't want to take any more of your time. But well, I hope this helps you a little bit. Thank you. Well, it, it always helps me. I, to, to, to meet somebody that's been a part of the history of this country yeah. for the last 55 years, and I know that it wasn't intentional, but sometimes you get picked up by the currents of these events. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I've been interested in this my whole life. And, uh, well, it's quite obvious to me you were, so I... <laughs> <laughs> I well, guess thank you. Your wife didn't ask no questions. But <laughs> well, she, let's say that, uh, like your wife, yeah. she indulges me. Well, I hope I've answered some of your questions. There's, there's a lot more like it that... Uh, I'm sure. I don't have, uh, have, you, have you ever considered doing a book? Oh yeah, I have I have wrote the first part of it. Uh, I wrote from my as far back as I can remember up to the time I went to work for the police department, and then mm -hmm. uh, I started the second uh, section, and I called it uh, the uh, the rest of the story, mm -hmm. and uh, so I found. Uh, couple of sheets, a uh, couple of four sheets that I'd typed out and I didn't know I'd done it years ago and I just haven't followed up on it. And I have some girl ladies that write, well I got a niece that writes and uh, so they're all, uh, I've got a lot of people that are wanting to help me do it. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, and, uh, I, I volunteer my services should you ever, <laughs> ever need me. Okay. Uh, you know, we could uh, yeah. it, we could do it through a series of interviews, and then yeah. take that and mold it into a mold it into a yeah. book to capture your memories. Yeah. Well, of course, have been uh, knowing just exactly how to do that. But uh, he's talking about uh, Bob Jackson and his uh, lady friend that he has now. Uh, they've been over here two or three times, and she's in my office in there one day, prowling around, 
<laughs> and uh, she, uh, uh, she, uh, Bob was in here uh, talking to me, and, and uh, she ran across uh, the first part of that second deal. And the way I started that, I was like, "This is going to be a true story. At least I hope it is." However, I'm going to be quoting my brother sometimes, and I'm not sure, always sure they'll tell the truth. <laughs> That's pretty and good. And she, she read that, and she started laughing. She hollered, Bob, come in here. Look, see how Jim starts his stories. <laughs> that's, that's a pretty good line. It tells me you've got some talent. Yeah. Well, I really, uh, if they don't get around to it and you ever feel that uh, you want to do something like that, I will uh, I will help you. I mean, this okay. is... Okay, well, I appreciate that. This is history, and... Uh, I'm glad to meet you again. Well, it's good to meet you, uh, sir. That's your wife. Okay. Uh, Thank you. I'll have a good day. All right. Where, where do you live? I live, we live in Oregon. Oregon? We're, we're right in the middle. If you look at a map of Oregon, we're right square in the middle of Oregon. They call it High Desert. Central Oregon. Central Oregon. We live in a little town called Primeville. Well, I've been to Oregon a few times. Uh, I don't remember the exact of that, but um, I've traveled well. I had some people in here one day. And they asked one of the ladies, she kept wanting to know where I talked to, because I've been to the Capitol in Washington six mm -hmm. times talking. And uh, so I told them, I said, well, if you really want to know, just like I went down with the theater last week and uh, talked, I said, if you really want to know, the ground I covered, I said, go up to uh, Maine and take you a course right straight across to California. <laughs> and then I said, then go back over to uh, to Alaska. I've been there twice making talks, and I went all the way to uh, as far as you can go on this way. And uh, I said, then there's about a dozen states right underneath mm -hmm. all of this this sector that I have talked in. So mm. uh, if you want to find out, that's uh, that's where I've been, where I've talked. Um, well, I, if I had more time, I'd like to ask you about World War II. I know you were involved yeah. in that. When I interviewed the FBI agents that were ordered to stay with Kennedy's body, yeah. they, yeah, they knew they had this slice of history, but that wasn't where their heart was. They cared about their service in World War II. That's what they were proudest of. Yeah. Was it, one was a paratrooper and one was a, a squadron leader. And yeah. uh, and so that's what they were really proud of. And I, yeah. I know that you're proud of your service as well. Well, there's, uh, I, of course, uh, I've been a good friend with a lot of the Secret Service and FBI and uh, the Rangers and all of that, I've, I've had good friends and all of them, and I've worked par in conjunction with them on things too, so. So uh, you know the ropes. Yeah, so. Well, Lori, we better let okay. this gentleman get, get.